The richest 10% owns 50% of the country's wealth. The poorest 50% owns only 10% of the wealth. You've probably heard statistics like that a thousand times. The traditional media repeats these statistics almost like mantras. Just to end up reinforcing government actions such as taxing the rich, progressive taxes, income redistribution programs and other nonsenses. Recently in the United States people were even more impressed when they found out that the 1% richest holds 50% of the wealth of the 10% richest. Wow, what a complete absurd. Death to capitalism. Occupy Wall Street. But before we go out breaking things like mentally challenged activists that might as well be struggling against the laws of gravity, let's ask ourselves a few questions first. Is it really the free market that generates this kind of inequality? Is income inequality a bad thing? Is the government able to reduce income inequality? In short, will a society without government be more unequal or less unequal than what we have today? Does anarcho-capitalism bring inequality? George Zipf was an American linguist who lived in the early 20th century. In 1935, he made a statistical evaluation of the English language, in which he noticed that the most frequent word in English is the definite article, the. This word appears 6% of the time. That is, 6% of all words in a book in English are the. In addition, he noticed that the second most common word was the preposition of which appeared half as often as the first, or 3% of the time. Then the third word, and, appears a third of the time, the fourth, two, appears a quarter of the time, and so on. That means the relative frequency of each word is inversely proportional to its order. Ziff's law is a form of statistical distribution that fits very well to describe the relative frequency of words in the English language. Like any statistical correlation, the values are not exact, but the trend is clear and it is easy to verify the fitting of the curve to a line in a logarithmic graph. It would be mere curiosity, but the same law applies to all other languages. Yes, the Portuguese language also follows Zipf's law, as well as any other language. Even fictional languages like Esperanto and Klingon also follow this law. It is incredible, but there is no explanation for this. Human beings exercising their natural creativity to produce language end up generating words that follow a specific, almost constant, distribution. Which alphabet is used, it doesn't matter. What is the order of the sentence? Subject, verb, object, as in the English or Portuguese language? Or verb, subject, object, as in Japanese? Or subject, object, verb, as in most other languages in the world? Zipf's law is still applied the same way and also in a number of other situations. Do you know where else Zipf's law might be applied? That's right, in the distribution of income. If you take the income distribution of the population of any country, you will find a distribution very similar to the expected curve of Zipf's law. The second richest person earns half the richest one does, the third one third, and so on. But I saw in a newspaper that the OECD Gini Index says that Brazil is more unequal than Sweden. If the curve is the same, why is there such a difference? Why are there countries and populations where the income distribution is more unequal and less unequal? Before that, let me state that there are some points that I disagree with the Gini Index calculation. First is the fact that they consider government budget in some areas as redistribution. In their account, if the government spent X dollars with education and health insurance for the poor, then it gave that value to the poor. That is simply not true. Some of the money is lost on government corruption, but most of it is lost in pure administrative inefficiency. The correct account should consider only the perceived subjective value effectively received by the poor, by the final beneficiary. If the government spends X dollars with the poorest, this does not mean that the value received by them is the same X dollars. In fact, the value is impossible to calculate since it's a subjective value outside the market. I consider it to be negligible. Another flaw in the OECD's index is that it leaves out the benefits earned by the government itself 
by politicians and civil servants. Some of the richest people in the country are in government. Here in Brazil, most of the rich and the upper middle class are public employees, so the government is, in fact, concentrating the income to their employees and politicians. The OECD makes these poor choices for clear economic reasons. They are funded by governments worldwide. So, politically, they would rather ignore this factor, which is particularly significant in a country such as Brazil. But even if we take out these, there is yet some difference in the income distribution among countries. We need an adjustment factor here. Ziff's law is, in fact, the discrete form of the Pareto distribution. The Pareto distribution has an alpha factor which can make it softer or harder. I do not want to go deep into statistics here, but in a simplified way, the shape of the curve is always the same, but the slope may vary. As I said, there is no theory to explain why these things are organized according to the same distribution. But among the various explanations, the one I like the best is the one that says that Zipf's law follows the human form of organizing our thinking. We create our language through a process of reuse of things we hear from others, with occasional personal creative additions. Someone may from time to time come up with a new word, or a new meaning for a word. If heard by many people, and are something interesting, are repeated by them. They can become part of the language. If they are not interesting, they are just dropped. The cool thing about this analogy is that it is directly applicable to the economy. In this model, economics is a social neural network. Basically, people produce and consume things they have learned to produce and consume. Every once in a while, however, someone invents something new something that may fall into oblivion or become something successful. It's exactly the same principle. This is a beautiful theory, but the main point here is that income inequality is inevitable. There will always be some income inequality, and it will always have the face of this curve. And in fact, it varies only in a narrow margin. So get used to 10% owning 50%, because it will always be something like that. That is, income inequality is not caused by the free market, it is a consequence of the human society. Is income inequality a bad thing? There are two ways to see this. I think what's bad is the misery, is the poverty, not income inequality. It is very sad that people die of starvation without having anything to eat. But if I am well fed, if I have a minimal comfortable life, what difference does it make that there are people who own private islands and a helicopter fleet? My view is that inequality itself is not a problem. Poverty is the problem. But there is another way to see this. We have to admit that envy is a part of human nature. We all have some degree of these bad feelings. Denying them is useless. When I see someone with a private island and a helicopter, I'd be lying if I said, no, I do not envy that guy, even if just a little. I'd be very happy to have a piece of that island, and just a sailboat, it doesn't even have to be a helicopter. So I can understand that there are people who are bothered by an equal income distribution. It is a natural human reflection of the envy. Socialists need not feel offended by it, it's natural, it's human. Just accept the envy and occupy Wall Street. But it's just not ethical to force another person to give up his money to satisfy your own envy, not even to keep the miserable from starving. You see, if economics is our social brain, you're killing some very important neurons by breaking the natural process of wealth generation. It may be hard now, but it's always the best choice in the future. In the end, in the long run, Society as a whole ends up losing much more if it violates the property and freedom rights of any person than through satisfying someone's envy. Can the government reduce the income inequality? Only if you use the OECD methodology that ignores government inefficiency. In their methodology, if the government gives 30% of what it received from tax to education and health for the poor, then it redistributed 30%, which is a joke it would be necessary to measure the real perceived value by the final users, which, due to lack of a market for that service, is impossible. You only have one government, so you have no market for state services, so they have no value. 
In practice, if you include the state's administrative efficiency and the benefits earned by public officials and politicians, you will find that the state always concentrates income. The small possible benefit the poorest may have will always be much smaller than the fortune of money that he concentrates and plays in the hands of public employees and politicians. No matter how much tax is charged, nor with whom pays the tax, the state is unable to reduce income inequality. It can, on the other hand, increase this inequality, as the Brazilian government shows time and again. This applies to all governments, from the Brazilian military dictatorship to the recent Brazilian Bolivarian governments, to the Obama administration to the next Trump administration, and also in Sweden. There are worse Gini indexes only because of these obvious glitches in OECD calculations. So, without government, will we live in a more egalitarian society? Definitely yes. Without the government to concentrate income, we will live in a more egalitarian society than today. Not only it, but in a society with less poverty and starvation. As all historical experience shows, the freer the market and less taxes are charged, the faster the economy grows, the more inventions and products come up and everyone's life improves. Is it possible for everybody to be rich? If you compare a quality of life today with the quality of life of our great-grandparents, everybody is already rich today. But in a single moment of history, there will always be income inequality. Government is a brain cancer that is only able to consume wealth and grow itself, never to redistribute, never to help anyone. Let's end this brain cancer. It is the best way to reduce inequality and to reduce starvation and poverty. And is the ethical thing to do as well. Let's embrace the society without government. Welcome to Ancapistan. If you like this video, please do not forget to like and share. Click the channel's logo to subscribe and you'll be notified of new videos.